I almost hate to get up here and cut it short. From the time I've been a little kid, I've loved singing night. And tonight uh, was an old school singing night. Kind of reminded me of the old days where you're out of breath and don't have much of a voice by the end. And the other tradition is, uh, and the reason why I really liked it as a kid is because I knew the sermon was going to be pretty short that night. So I'll try not to disappoint uh, in that tradition. Uh, but no, I love singing night, especially more now, uh, because the songs are so uplifting. And one of the songs that I just suspected somebody would request is that the battle belongs to the Lord. And that song always makes me think of King Jehoshaphat. Are you, am I the only one? Maybe. Let's turn over to first, 2 Corinthians chap, sorry, 2 Chronicles 20 and uh, read about what happened in that story with King Jehoshaphat where that statement is made that the battle belongs to God or to the Lord. And it's interesting. It's a, I selected this passage also because this is a story about singing, singing to God on their way to the battle. In 2 Chronicles 20, beginning in verse 3, we'll, we'll quickly uh, read through the story, but it's the, a time when Judah is just a tiny little uh, nation on the map, very weak, and they're terrified because Moab and Ammon and the Edomites have gathered together to go against the tiny nation of Judah, and King Jehoshaphat is afraid. Verse 3, it says, Jehoshaphat was afraid, <clears throat> and he turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Pretty good start. That's a great uh, thing to have done. Now look at Jehoshaphat's prayer, starting in verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand, so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? They have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary there for your name, saying, Should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry to you in our distress, and you will hear and deliver us. Now behold, the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. See how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out from your possession, from which you have given to us as an inheritance. O our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are on you. What a faithful prayer to God. He recognizes that he is powerless. He looks around and knows they are no match for these three armies that have allied themselves against them. But he says, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. He's putting his trust in God. And then God speaks through the prophet or the priest Jehaziel, starting in verse 15. And he said, listen, all Judah and, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, Thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jeruel. You, will, you need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves, stand, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. That's a wonderful response. It must have filled them with confidence that they have the Lord on their side. Notice how the king then responds, a faithful response, starting in verse 20. <clears throat> they rose early in the morning <clears throat> and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me. O Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. When he had consulted with the people, 
He appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire as they went out before the army, and they said, Give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. That was their song. That was their battle cry, was to sing a song to God. And what was that song? Give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Those of us who've been studying the Psalms may recognize that phrase. It's in a lot of those historical Psalms that we studied this morning. Those Psalms that recount all the great things that God has done for his people. And they will repeat, give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. What a confident thing to do, to go into battle with your singers right up front, praising God for what he is about to do. And verse 22 shows what he did. When they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so they were routed. For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them completely. And when they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they, de- they helped to destroy one another. Did the people of Judah have to lift a finger in this battle? It's just as magnificent as perhaps the more well-known stories of the walls of Jericho, when God takes care of the army for them. They simply had to go out and face them. They still had to face the enemy, to go face the enemy with trust in the Lord that he was going to win the battle. They were singing praises as they went, and God did, in fact, win the battle for them. See, King Jehoshaphat helps us understand this concept that the battle belongs (coughs) to the Lord. It's not my battle to win. You know, Jehoshaphat wasn't always so faithful. A couple chapters earlier, (coughs) he allies himself with none other than King Ahab. He married his child to Ahab's child so that they would have an alliance. Why do kings do that? Well, to have some help when they may have to face an enemy, right? To have somebody else on their side. He thought having King Ahab, the wicked King Ahab and his wife Jezebel on his side might help him out. That was not a faithful move. That was not trusting in the Lord to win his battles. That was trusting in his own human reasoning. And he was rebuked in chapter 19, verse 2. Jehu comes to him and says, should you help the wicked? And love those who hate the Lord, and so bring wrath on yourself from the Lord. He took that message to heart, and so by chapter 20, he is trusting completely in the Lord. So think for just a moment now about the battles that we face. We're in a spiritual battle. We are up against the devil who's seeking our souls. We are uh, having to face the, the challenge of sin that can keep us from that eternal destination that we all desire to be with God. Think for a moment just about the question that some of you may be uh, considering on whether or not you might become a Christian. You know the truth. You know that uh, you have sin in your life and there's something that needs to be done about it. You know that Jesus paid the price for those sins already. The, the, The price has already been paid, but you haven't yet Put on Christ. You haven't obeyed him. Maybe you're thinking, as some people often do, I'm not good enough to be a Christian. I need to get some of these things under control first. Is that the concept of the battle belongs to the Lord? Or that the battle is something that you yourself are going to fight first, and then you'll come to the Lord? No, see, the the Lord will fight for you only once you put your trust in him. When you obey the gospel, it's a humble admission that you are a sinner, that you're helpless. There's nothing you can do about your sin. You need God's help. God's help to remove those sins from you because you can't pay for them yourselves. You do repent. You do turn away from your sin. You're then baptized into Christ and those sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus. But then you have God on your side. Does the battle continue? Absolutely. You wake up the next morning and that same sin, that same temptation is there, if not even more strongly, because now the devil is seeking you to devour. He wants to get you back. 
but now you have the Lord on your side. That battle against sin is not something you have to face alone. You need to become a Christian today. You need to have your sins washed away today so that then the Lord will be on your side in all of your battles. Put your trust in God. Obey God today. Don't put it off. If there's any other need that you may have spiritually, those who are in Christ, who have not been trusting in the Lord, tonight's a good time to make that right as well. Whatever your spiritual need is, we invite you to come while we sing our invitation song. Jesus is